Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. I suspect most of us remember very well being transfixed just one year ago to the hearings for now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Today, as the court begins its annual term, Justice Kavanaugh will be part of a court deciding on some of the most fundamental cases that affect our politics, our culture, and our freedoms, all in an atmosphere that, if even possible, is more polarized than it was a year ago during those hearings. So who is Brett Kavanaugh? Certainly the one-week FBI investigation and the televised circus that was his hearing may not have told us the whole story. For that, we need rely on the reporting of Robin Pogrebin and Kate Kelly in their new book, The Education of Brett Kavanaugh. Robin Pogrebin is a reporter for the New York Times Culture Desk and has written extensively about the nexus between politics, finances, government, and culture. She's also covered the media and business. She was a reporter at the New York Observer and was an associate producer at ABC News for Peter Jennings' documentary unit. It is my pleasure to welcome Robin Pogrebin here to talk about the education of Brett Kavanaugh, an investigation. Robin, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. I want to talk a little bit about the context of, of this whole story. And certainly Brett Kavanaugh is somebody who was or thought he was on a trajectory to the federal bench from the time he was in college, as, as you talk about. And one wonders if, if Brett Kavanaugh had been appointed to the, even to the Supreme Court by, by George W. Bush as opposed to Donald Trump, how it might have been different in terms of, of what we learned about him, his behavior, the whole story surrounding his confirmation. It's a good question. I mean, we uh, we know that actually uh, Judge Kavanaugh, now Justice Kavanaugh, worked for two terms for George Bush, who became a real mentor to him. They developed a very close relationship. And I think that Brett Kavanaugh is very much in the mold of a Bush, um, more so than a Trump. In fact, it speaks to the to the idea that that President Trump originally um, wasn't necess- that Brett Kavanaugh wasn't at the top of, Brett, of Trump's list because uh, there was concern among some Republicans that he was too much in the Bush mold as opposed to the Trump mold. He was too much a creature of the swamp, as they call it, speaking of sort of the world of establishment, Washington, D.C., um, and frankly, that he was too much of, of a kind of a, a Justice Roberts, a moderate voice rather than a kind of guaranteed uh, conservative who would cement the right wing tilt of the court. So I think had George Bush uh, uh, appointed him, uh, you know, perhaps things would have been different um, in terms of how it all rolled out. However, the allegations are the allegations, and they may have surfaced nonetheless, and they would probably have created the toxic atmosphere regardless. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, I mean, with George Bush, there was also his background with alcohol and partying and all the things that went along with it, although, albeit, there wasn't the, the sexual abuse allegations. There wasn't the sexual abuse allegations, and it's an interesting reference because, you know, we have also thought about this in the context of our book where George Bush actually came out and owned that history. He um, kind of acknowledged it, apologized for it, said he had stopped drinking since. It was kind of a human moment of admitting um, frailty. There were many who posit the idea that if Brett Kavanaugh had done something similar, taken a middle-of-the-road approach uh, rather than his kind of righteous indignation of his final day of testimony, that perhaps there would have been more public sympathy for him, uh, for those who found that performance disqualifying. However, under the, um, the in the Trump era, there is also the school of thought that you can kind of give no quarter. Right. And had B- B- Brett Kavanaugh um, admitted to sort of being a flawed human being in the past, uh, that would have eliminated his chances for the court. Right. I mean, it was in that very Trumpian mold of deny, deny, deny. Exactly. Deny, deny, deny. That is the playbook. It's actually a playbook that also Clarence Thomas espoused um, in 1991 that also worked to great effect. The outcome was the same. Um, both of them were accused of sexual misconduct, and both of them were confirmed. Um, if you recall, um, Justice Clarence Thomas talked about a high-tech lynching, and right. what happens is it, it, it turned the sort of public sentiment um, to some degree towards um, these men as the victims rather than the women who had testified against them. Right. The other overriding aspect of the hearings themselves, as, as you talk about, is how fast it all went. The fact that there really was never time to to analyze anything. Yes, and that's a big part of why we went back at this subject, Jeff, in our book, was because we were part of the original team, Kate Kelly and I, that reported on 
these hearings for the New York Times, you know, the events were coming fast and furious. You're grabbing at whatever you can to try to report it out. And you don't have the luxury of time to get all the facts and also reflect on, on what you're finding, as well as to flesh these people out as three-dimensional characters. There was a real sense in which people had their minds made up going into this um, kind of highly charged process that was very much informed by partisanship. And so we didn't really understand, you know, what how conservative was Brett Kavanaugh? What was his past behavior like? Had he, we see these allegations from the, between the years of ages of 17 and 19. What's he been like in the 36 years since? What kind of contemporaneous corroboration is there for Christine Blasey Ford's allegations and frankly for Deborah Ramirez's, who was a college classmate who also um, had her own alleged experience with him that was never really fully explored. She never testified publicly. So there was just fertile ground for more exploration and, and inquiry. There was also this odd, I mean, coming back to what we were saying before, this odd nexus between his personal behavior and and his ideology, between his ideology and his public persona, because in taking a page out of the Trump playbook, deny, 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 it really took the, the, the impetus off, off that moderate aspect of his ideology and really put him in a much more extreme camp almost automatically as a result of his behavior and how he responded to all of this. Yes, I think that um, when you saw his testimony on September 27th, where he is citing sort of revenge on behalf of the Clintons right. and this idea of uh, kind of a democratic conspiracy to sort of um, blow me up and take me down, as he put it, um, there was this sense that, you know, he was embittered now and was seeing this completely in political terms when, as we know, the court is supposed to be sort of the last bastion of, of sort of the non non-political branch of government. Um, now, clearly, you know, starting back with the Robert Bork hearings right through the Clarence Thomas hearings and kind of the, the shutting out of Merrick Garland from consideration by the Republicans, you see that the, the judicial branch now even is not immune to these kind of uh, this arena of political battle. And, and I think that to that extent, people very much saw Brett Kavanaugh as a product of the conservative movement. He had kind of come up um, through the Federalist Society in terms of being supported by that organization, which is very much now in charge of kind of choosing Trump's judges and has had great success on that front and views that as a, a very important kind of legacy to leave for, from, for this uh, Trump administration. Um, and so you do see this idea that perhaps Brett Kavanaugh will embody the this right-wing tilt of the court. On the other hand, his history um, does not bear that out. He, he, he does seem like more of a pragmatist, more of a letter of the law judge than an ideologue. Um, and actually his performance on the Supreme Court sort of remains to be seen as to which way he'll fall. But predictions are that he might be the swing vote. He might actually end up um, a sort of embodying the very seat of, uh, of Justice Kennedy, who he replaced in, in, in a much more kind of unpredictable way. Given all of this, as you and, and Kate Kelly began digging into this story in a much slower way than, than the hearings themselves and the speed of that, talk a little bit about how you began this, where, where you really started looking for some answers in all of this. So we kind of divided up the work because um, we did only kind of have a year in which to get this turned around. We wanted this book to come out on the, uh, around now, the anniversary of his confirmation. Um, we had we came to the story for the New York Times. Both Kate and I were part of the original investigative team on the Kavanaugh story um, around the confirmation hearings a year ago. Kate had a personal connection in that she had grown up in the D.C. area. She's 10 years younger and behind Kavanaugh, but she went to an all-girls school that was one of those sister schools in the cohort of uh, Georgetown Prep where he attended. So she had some sort of personal sense of that milieu and, and, and how to kind of navigate that terrain. I was a college classmate of Brett Kavanaugh's. I was in the Yale class of 1987 as he was. I was actually in his freshman dorm in our first year. So there was some not only sense of what Yale was like back then in the late 80s, but also a sense of his, um, you know, we had some overlap socially. My college roommates were athletes, uh, varsity athletes. 
and he was uh, friendly with varsity athletes himself and uh, kind of moved in a world of people who I knew somewhat. Um, and so it was interesting to kind of go back to those classmates and try to flesh out those worlds and understand so how they, how they informed his experience and his personal and professional development. And then we also wanted to look at his 12 years on the D.C. circuit, which we felt had kind of been lost in, in the rush of reporting. You know, what was he like as a judge? What were his decisions like? Um, and also, what was he like as a person in terms of people who had dealt with him um, in, in, their, in the professional sphere as well as the personal sphere? And this idea that he had championed female clerks um, and tried to develop their careers on the court was an, seemed like an important element to flesh out. Um, there are some who sort of cynically say perhaps he did that in order to kind of um, preempt these allegations that surfaced later in his life. On the other hand, he seems to meaningfully have mentored these women in, in a way they testify to to this day of having really nurtured them um, um, in their careers, even after they, they left his um, his chambers. So it's, you know what it is, it's a much more complicated mm -hmm. picture. We ultimately felt that we probably satisfied no one because <laughs> this is ultimately a very human story of someone who was flawed personally, who seems to have had behavior he's probably not proud of from when he was young but has arguably um, matured in the intervening years and perhaps become a different person. There's also the difference, with, which was talked about during the hearings, of the context of the time, that the mid-'80s were different than the world we live in today. That's right, and I think it's really important to understand that there was no real Me Too consciousness then. There, people did not have a sense of self-awareness about their behavior and, and, frankly, how words can be wounding as well as conduct. Um, and they're just, you know, we hadn't had our consciousness raised as a culture um, around these issues. There was also kind of a casual misogyny we found from his high school years that seemed to also be somewhat pervasive in sort of the athletic group that he kind of hang, hung out with in college, where, you know, they were sort of two different people um, under the influence of alcohol than they were in their day-to-day -day dealings with women, and it was important to kind of um, understand that, and also to sort of see how uh, they're just people weren't calling each other out on certain behavior. They were kind of looking the other way. It was sort of dismissed as boys being boys. That is no longer the case now. The other aspect of the, of him that that you uncovered is that he wasn't Jay Gadsby. That he worked hard. That that he really you know paid attention to academics. That the sports were important to him. That there was a much more hardworking ethic there than the public persona might have led us to. Yes, I think that there was this kind of he was a bit of like a covert student where for whatever reason Brett Kavanaugh did not want to lead with his intelligence. He, you know, worked very hard by, you know, what the reporting that we found was, you know, classmates describing him burning the midnight oil in his dorm room, working very late. Um he, to get into Yale Law School is difficult now. It was difficult then. It's a very small class, so that was not easy to do. Although uh, Brett's grandfather went to Yale, so perhaps that helped him in, in a legacy way getting in undergrad. He did not have connections that we can see going into law school. And so he really had to, it was very difficult to get in there and you needed to have the grades to do it. People described to us, some of his classmates, hearing him announced for awards and honors at graduation saying, wow, I had no idea Brett was smart. So for whatever reason, that was kind of not a currency for him. He, he was, you know, what we find is sort of a person who wanted to fit in, not stand out. Um, he wasn't politically known for his politics at all. Um, he didn't join the Federalist Society till law school. You know, Yale was a somewhat um, political place at the time. People were protesting apartheid. There was a, Re a Yale Republicans group. People don't remember Brett kind of raising his hand in class, speaking out publicly, joining things, having much of, a, of an identity that made a strong impression. And I think that perhaps in retrospect was by design. You know, he managed to kind of offend no one, and that uh, worked to his advantage in terms of, you know, having people sort of not necessarily find him objectionable when it came time to auditioning for important positions um, on the judiciary. and that, But that's pretty much who he was, as you describe him. He was very kind of a, a white bread kind of guy, didn't stand out very much, and, and wasn't even that comfortable around women early on, as you talk about. 
Yeah, I I think that is also a counterintuitive thing that we found, which is that, first of all, in terms of him being somewhat of like an everyman, uh, somebody who didn't necessarily stand out, some of his friends jokingly referred to him as ham on white. Um, He was so kind of benign in the impression he made. Um, But I think also you see someone who kind of didn't have the moves and get the girls necessarily, you know, where he was portrayed as a as a sexual predator in these hearings a year ago. In fact, you ultimately had him testifying on public television that he was a virgin through college. And what you see is this kind of behavior that was somewhat ham handed, that he was sort of awkward around women and perhaps used alcohol to kind of as a social lubricant, um, that he uh, was playing more towards impressing the guys than he was towards getting the girls, that um, nobody really remembers him having a girlfriend. Uh, This was not somebody who was very smooth socially, and and I think that definitely sheds light uh, in terms of, you know, what kind of a person might have gone into these experiences with Christine Blasey Ford and Deborah Ramirez and kind of behaved badly um, in a way that was just kind of had, had no sort of real sense of himself. But, you know, in his own mind, you know, didn't necessarily have um, the kind of motives we have ascribed to him in terms of being, you know, a bad guy who wanted to attack women. He, right. he, it may have just been like he was, you know, a kind of a, 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 a bit of a bully. And how does that relate as, as you've come to see it, as you and Kate Kelly have come to see it, with respect to how we see Christine Blasey Ford and Deborah Ramirez? I think with Christine Blasey Ford, um, what you have is a high school situation where they were kind of part of this world of, you know, same-sex schools where, frankly, I think there was some sense from what I know in terms of uh, same-sex schools and what we see from reporting on those years is that um, there's just people were less used to each other um, in terms of just men, boys being friends with girls in a kind of a peer relationship. And so there was a sort of a sexualized tenor to those relationships rather than kind of growing up with these people as peers and with a, a sense of mutual respect. And, you know, Christine Blasey Ford was considerably younger than he was in that situation. Um, and, you know, there are, there are people who have posited to us this idea that, you know, the reason that so many people around her description of that incident don't remember it is because it wasn't meaningful to them, um, which is something we found in exploring issues of memory and sexual assault is that if a, if an experience was routine, you know, people who were at that party with her would have no reason to remember it, whereas for her, obviously having someone jump on top of her and, as she alleged, cover her mouth um, to the extent that she thought she might lose her life was incredibly formative and has stayed with her um, indefinitely. The case of, of Deborah Ramirez, I mean, this was a, um, a one example that we wanted to flesh out because we felt like she never really got her due. She did not testify publicly. And people also somewhat dismissed her um, allegations as just part of what Republicans described as kind of a pile on against him. But in fact, she has also a very clear memory of having been um, at a drunken dorm party freshman year um, at which uh, where they were playing a drinking game. She was targeted to drink repeatedly. Um, Brett Kavanaugh was part of it and um, ended up exposing himself to her. And what she remembered almost um, as worse than that was the friends, including Brett Kavanaugh, laughing at her in a way that was deeply humiliating, particularly because she came to Yale with a sense of inadequacy to begin with and, and being kind of behind the eight ball that perhaps she didn't belong there as someone from a lower middle class background um, with a, a, a father who is Puerto Rican. She worked her way through high school and college. She had to kind of work in the dining halls at Yale to make to in order to afford tuition. And so she came to that experience already feeling like perhaps she didn't belong there. And this just affirmed that sense of insecurity. I mean, part of the the overlay to all of this is that it is a, as, as you've been talking about, a far more complex human story than the political story, which is what everyone plugs into, where you see two people up there, as in something like, you know, the Algerius case, where you just say somebody has to be lying. It's far more complex than that. 
Yes, it is. And, and unfortunately, with these stories of sexual misconduct, it, it is a, a he said, she said situation. Unless you can flesh out um, this contemporary, contemporaneous corroboration, which we found in both cases for Christine Blasey Ford and Deborah Ramirez. Um, in the case of Deborah Ramirez, you know, there are seven people who heard about her story, two of them independent of her telling them about it. Um, that's what, having done a number of these Me Too stories at the Times, that's what you look for. Did she tell anyone about it? Did she write it down at the time? Did she tell a family member? In the case of Deborah Ramirez, she did tell her mother. Her mother remembers her talking about it and being so upset. Her mother thought she had been raped and that and questioned whether she wanted her to go to the Yale authorities. Um, in the case of Christine Blasey Ford, it's harder in terms of contemporaneous corroboration. She told no friends. She told no family members. However, many of the details that she describes from that summer do check out her good friend Leland Kaiser, who she puts having been at that party where this alleged incident happened, had dated Mark Judge, who was also allegedly at the party. Um, Christine Blasey Ford had dated a good friend of Brett Kavanaugh, Chris Garrett, who was known as Squee, and that's how he was referred to in Brett Kavanaugh's testimony. Um, that we also, You also look at, do these witnesses kind of have a history of integrity? Um, have they been known to lie? Um, you know, in the case of Christine Blasey Ford, she took a polygraph test. Even an ex-boyfriend who raised questions about her testimony as to the uh, the, 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 pos- the viability of that party happening said that he had never known her to lie. So you have to kind of report around these women's stories to the degree that you can. It is very tricky when you're reporting on sexual misconduct, but that doesn't mean it isn't possible to get some sense of whether these accounts are credible. And finally, Robin, what do you think if, if anything, the lasting impact on Brett Kavanaugh will be, and how will it impact, if at all, his tenure on the court? So, I, I mean, I think that this he, uh, Brett Kavanaugh has kind of been through um, the gauntlet on this, and um, while he has always said that he kind of looks on the sunrise side of the mountain, meaning he's an optimist, that's a phrase he would quote from George Bush, uh, I think this experience certainly tested that optimism on his part. We know that Clarence Thomas became rather embittered mm-hmm. after his experience of going through this and, and that we have seen that playing out in his um, tenure on the court. I think the feeling is that in terms of Brett Kavanaugh that so far he is going to try to move forward, um, but on the other hand, um, he is, has changed his life from what we know, where it's difficult for him to be out in public, um, whereas other members of the court are kind of celebrated and honored um, in, in certain public settings. I think Brett Kavanaugh is still trying to outlive this experience, get past it, get beyond it, um, and be known for his record on the court that rather than be known as the person who was accused of this sexual misconduct. Robin Pogrebin. The book is The Education of Brett Kavanaugh. I thank you so much for spending time with us today, Robin. Thank you for having me. Thank you.